Lady Boulet, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. Today, we're continuing to explore African American culture, and we have a fascinating subject. We're going to talk about how five slave women outsmarted the system. These women are interesting and just fascinating, and I think you're going to enjoy meeting them. So let's get into it. Let's talk about how five slave women outsmarted the system. Our first slave diva is Mary Elizabeth Bowser. Mary Bowser was born in 1839 in Virginia on the plantation of Richard Van Loo. At a very early age, her parents were sold, so she was pretty much a child of the plantation. When Mary was 12, Richard Van Loo died, and his daughter Elizabeth inherited his slaves. She immediately set them free. Elizabeth Bendel was an abolitionist, which is to say that she did not believe in slavery and worked to end the institution. But even though they were free, several of the slaves, including Mary, chose to stay with Elizabeth. It was discovered that Mary Bowser was very intelligent, so she was taught to read and write. Elizabeth Van Loo had formed a circle of spies with the Union Army. Her goal was to pass on as much information as she could about the Confederacy and the Confederate Army. When Mary was about 14, Elizabeth arranged to have her employed at the Confederate White House. She was to act as if she was a dumb, slow slave. Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, was from Mississippi. He was just a dumb, slow slave, so he hired her. It is said that Mary was a good actress and played the part well. In fact, the president thought he had hired a dumb, slow slave. In fact, he had hired a very intelligent young woman. As she went about her chores in the Confederate White House, she listened. She remembered, and she wrote down everything she heard. When President Jefferson Davis met with his cabinet members, she listened. When he was away from the White House, she snooped around, reading dispatches, taking notes, and passing on what she'd heard. Mary passed on highly classified information to Union spies, such as Confederate troop movements, military strategies, and treasury reports. She even passed on how much money they had. Her intelligence information was passed on to officers all the way up to the commander of the Union Army, General Ulysses S. Grant. At the end of the war, General Grant became President of the United States. He, he said this about Mary. She passed on the most effective and useful of all the information I received from Richmond during the Civil War. End of quote. This is a very high compliment to this young woman. For centuries, Mary's story as the Union's most effective spy was not known. But in 1995, Mary was inducted into the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame as one of the highest placed and most productive espionage agents of the Civil War. Mary Bowser succeeded in a highly dangerous mission to the great benefit of the Union and in her effort to free her people who were still in bondage. I want to emphasize that what she was doing was very dangerous. Had she been caught, she almost certainly would have been put to death. It's not known what happened to Mary Bowser. Jefferson Davis knew there was a leak in his White House and may have suspected her. That is what the research information says, but I seriously doubt that President Jefferson Davis thought that a slave could pull that off. Nevertheless, Mary is believed to have married and spent the rest of her life living abroad. In truth, it is not known what happened to Mary Bowser. Her whereabouts remain unknown. What is known is that she did a great service to the Union Army in helping them to win the Civil War and bringing the institution of slavery 
to an end. Mary Elizabeth Bowser, a phenomenal ex-slave woman who outsmarted the system. Mary Elizabeth Bowser, thank you. Rest in peace. My information comes from the New World Encyclopedia and other sources. Our next slave diva is Ellen Craft, and this is one to just stop and take a deep breath. Ellen Craft was born in 1826 on a slave plantation in Jones County, Georgia. She was born to a mulatto slave woman and her slave master, so Ellen Craft looked like a white person. She married a slave from a plantation in Macon, Georgia by the name of William. William was a master carpenter. He was so good that he was rented out by his owner to local builders. William was allowed to keep part of his earnings, which he saved, and this was unusual for a slave. This story takes an almost amusing turn when in the fall of 1848, this couple decided that they didn't want to spend Christmas in slavery. So they planned a great escape. Ellen dressed up as a white man and William posed as her personal servant. With the money they'd saved, they bought first-class tickets by train to New Orleans. In New Orleans, they again bought first-class tickets on a steamboat. Ellen was so convincing as a wealthy white planter that she was invited to dine with the captain. The couple arrived in Philadelphia on Christmas Day. Here they connected with the free black community and with the abolitionist movement. They stayed in Philadelphia for a time and then traveled to Boston, Massachusetts, where again, they connected with the free black community and the abolitionist movement. Their daring escape from slavery was highly publicized and they were celebrated as famous fugitive slaves. This daring couple taunted their former slave masters by sending out Christmas cards, which read, Merry Christmas, the great escape from slavery of Ellen and William Craft. In Boston, they were encouraged to go on the speaking circuit and tell about their slave experience. This was how the abolitionists worked, get former slaves in a big city in a free state before an audience of sympathetic wealthy supporters and have them talk about the horrors of slavery. The crafts were living their lives of freedom and enjoying every minute of it, but in 1850, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act. This meant that slave catchers could come into a free state and force escaped slaves back into slavery. The crafts were at risk in Boston because of their high profile existence and because they bragged about escaping from slavery. Boston was also one of the cities that slave catchers scoured looking for escaped or runaway slaves. So we can bet that the crafts would have been caught. They had a decision to make, whether to stay in the United States and take their chances moving from free state to free state or whether to leave the country. They decided to flee to England where they stayed until slavery ended, but they didn't keep silent in England. They continued to tell of their great escape and to speak out against the horrors of slavery. In 1860, they published their story, The Great Escape of William and Ellen Craft from Slavery. William and Ellen Craft chose freedom and possibly death over slavery. What they did was dangerous, but the call to freedom was greater than their fear. This is a courageous power couple, and they indeed outsmarted the system. I enjoyed reading about them. I love their courage and the fact that once they left slavery, they did not end up back in slavery. So William and Ellen Craft, rest in peace. Our next slave diva is Elizabeth Keckley. Elizabeth Keckley was born in Dinwiddie County, Virginia in February of 1818 in the slave quarters of a Colonel Armistead Burrell. 
She grew up thinking that a slave on another plantation was her father, but she was to learn as a young woman that her slave master, Armistead Burrell, was actually her biological father. Elizabeth had a traumatic childhood. She was both physically and sexually abused. She was tossed from pillar to post, from one plantation to another, and everywhere she went, she was abused. If we were to put a face to the tragic mulatto, it would be the face of Elizabeth Keckley. Elizabeth Keckley was a beautiful woman. Because of her exotic looks, she was forced into a relationship with a white man as a very young woman, and this relationship produced a child, a son. Elizabeth was also a gifted seamstress, a designer of beautiful, colorful clothes. And while still a slave, she was able to build a loyal clientele of wealthy white women. In 1855, after many years of hard work, Elizabeth had saved $1,200. With the help of her clients, she was able to buy freedom for herself and her son. In 1860, she moved to Washington, D.C. With references and recommendations from her former clients, she was able to open a dressmaking shop. Word quickly got around about the new talented seamstress and her business began thriving. Soon, she was designing clothes for the wives of the prominent men of town, Marina Davis, wife of Jefferson Davis, Mary Custis Lee, wife of Robert E. Lee, and the wife of Stephen Douglas. At last, the wife of President Abraham Lincoln came calling. Elizabeth Keckley became the favorite designer of Mary Todd Lincoln. Mrs. Lincoln was a lover of clothes, and Mary designed beautiful clothes, as you can see in these pictures. The dress that's on the screen now was designed for Mrs. Lincoln to wear to President Lincoln's second inaugural ball. Once she became a successful designer, Elizabeth remembered her people. Runaway slaves, who were called contraband, descended upon Washington, D.C. as the land of promise. What they found was a situation not better than what they left on the plantation, but at least now they could call themselves free. Elizabeth Cakley established the Contraband Relief Association to provide food, clothing, shelter, and medical care for runaway slaves. She networked with independent black churches, free blacks, and other organizations to help provide necessities for the runaway slaves. Historians tend to make a lot about her association with Mary Todd Lincoln. They claimed the two had a special relationship and that Mrs. Lincoln shared personal information with Elizabeth. Toward the end of her life, a book was written called Behind the Scenes or 30 Years a Slave. This book was attributed to Elizabeth Keckley. In the book, Elizabeth supposedly reveals private details about Mrs. Lincoln and the Lincoln White House. The book caused quite a stir. It upset Mrs. Lincoln so that she never spoke to Elizabeth again. The book was ghostwritten by someone else that historians believe took advantage of Elizabeth in her old age. It was most likely done by an enemy of the Lincolns who wanted to smear the Lincoln White House and tarnish the Lincoln's image. Elizabeth Keckley lived to be 89 years old. Her son was killed at the Battle of Wilson's Creek in the Civil War. Elizabeth Keckley overcame a system that was designed to destroy her. But in spite of poverty, brutality, and misfortune, she kept her dignity and rose above her circumstances. And you can look at the pictures of her and tell that she was a classy woman with a particular kind of dignity about herself. The system could not break her, and in that way alone, she outsmarted it. Elizabeth Keckley, a phenomenal woman. Peace and sweet rest forever. Our next diva is Harriet Robinson Scott. Harriet Robinson was born a slave in Virginia in 1820. 
She was born into the household of a federal agent named Lawrence Tolliver. Lawrence Tolliver moved around a lot, and when Harriet was a teenager, they moved to Minnesota. It was in Minnesota that Harriet met her husband-to-be, Dred Scott, a name we're very familiar with. Harriet and Dred Scott married in 1836. She then became the property of Dr. John Emerson, Dred Scott's slave master. The couple traveled to several states with the doctor and his wife, but they ended up in Missouri, St. Louis to be exact. Harriet and Dred Scott became parents to two daughters, Eliza and Lizzie Scott. In 1843, Dr. John Emerson died and his widow, Irene, inherited the Scott family. She hired them out to work and took all of their money. In 1846, Harriet petitioned the court for her freedom due to the fact that she lived in the free state of Minnesota Harriet was aware that she'd have a good chance of being granted her freedom. Dred Scott also petitioned for his freedom in 1846 in a separate case. He petitioned on the same grounds as his wife, that he'd lived in free states and was therefore entitled to his freedom. Irene Emerson found a way to keep the Scott family in the custody of the St. Louis County Sheriff and she continued collecting their wages. On January 12th of 1850, Harriet Scott was granted her freedom, but Irene Emerson intervened again and appealed the ruling. This time, the St. Louis District Court combined Harriet and Dred Scott's cases so that the entire Scott family was included in the Dred Scott versus Sanford case. This case dragged on for 11 years, but in 1857, the Supreme Court ruled that the Scots would remain slaves. Pictured here is Roger B. Taney. He was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time of the ruling. The court ruled that Dred Scott was not a citizen, but property. Roger Taney further stated that Black people cannot be citizens of the United States and have no rights except the ones that white people give them. Whites are superior to blacks. Slavery is legal. End of quote. This ruling was a blow to the Scott family, but two months later, a man named Taylor Blow brought the Scots and immediately set them free. Unfortunately, Dred Scott only lived 18 months as a free man, but Harriet continued working and even bought her own home. She and her daughters lived free for the rest of their lives. In this picture is Charlie Taney. He is a descendant of the Chief Justice who refused to free the Scott family. Charlie is apologizing to the descendants of Dred Scott for his uncle's words. In this picture, are descendants of Dred Scott. They are honoring their ancestor at his gravesite. Both men left a legacy. One left a legacy of shame and the other left a legacy of fame. Harriet Scott indeed outsmarted the system. She petitioned for her right to be free. And though the courts ruled against her, she was nevertheless set free eight years before slavery ended. She is a beacon of hope and courage. She stood on her right to be a free human being, and in the end, she prevailed. Harriet Robinson Scott, a phenomenal woman who married a phenomenal man. Our last slave diva is Mary Ellen Pleasant. Mary Ellen was born in Augusta, Georgia on August 19, 1814. In her autobiography, she states that her mother was a full-blooded Louisiana black woman. She was a mixed race heritage herself. The identity of her father is uncertain. When Mary Ellen was young, she was sold as a bonded servant to a Quaker storekeeper in Nantucket, Massachusetts. As a young adult, 
Mary Ellen became deeply involved in the abolitionist movement. She was an adamant supporter of the Underground Railroad and spent her life working tirelessly to end slavery. She married a wealthy white passing floor contractor named James Smith. This man had bought a plantation and freed the slaves that came with it. Mary Ellen and James Smith worked to help runaway slaves out of the South and into Ohio and other free states, including Canada. James Smith died four years after they married, but left money and instructions for her to continue working with the Underground Railroad. In 1848, Mary Ellen began a partnership with John James Pleasant, called J.J. He was also an abolitionist. They became so aggressive in their abolitionist activities that attention was brought to them. When this happened, they moved from Massachusetts to New Orleans. While in New Orleans, they heard about the California Gold Rush. J.J. went ahead and checked out the prospects. He wrote back that the area was promising for the Underground Railroad. When Mary Ellen reached California in 1852, she passed for white. However, she did not hide her identity from her black acquaintances. She had operating capital and she used it to finance businesses. She invested in laundries, dairies, restaurants, and she opened a boarding house. What's impressive is that she did much of the work in these businesses herself. Mary Ellen was still heavily involved in the Underground Railroad. When ex-slaves arrived in San Francisco, she employed them in her businesses or helped them find work elsewhere. Mary Ellen became an activist for civil rights. When she and two other black women were ejected from a trolley, she brought a lawsuit against the company and won. She brought discrimination lawsuits on behalf of ex-slaves and very often she won. Because of her activism, Mary Ellen was called the mother of civil rights in California or the Harriet Tubman of California. Her businesses were also thriving. On the advice of a bank clerk named Tom Bell, she invested in Quicksilver. With the success of her other business ventures, she amassed a fortune of $30 million, $800 million by today's estimates. Her investments helped start Wells Fargo Bank, and she is considered one of the first self-made black women millionaires in America. Her resolve to see slavery abolished cannot be overstated. Her most spectacular effort was her decision to fund John Brown, the revolutionary that led the attack on the federal arsenal at Harpers Ferry, Virginia in 1859. She sent $30,000 to fund the raid, and the note found in his pocket after he was killed was written by her. It read, The axe is laid at the root of the tree. When the first blow is struck, there will be more money and more help. The raid was designed to speed up the Civil War, which abolitionists believed would bring an end to slavery. It was believed at the time that wealthy white northerners had provided the funds for the raid. For certain, nobody would have believed that this young, beautiful, white passing woman would have taken such a risk. But in her later years, Mary Ellen wanted it known that it was she that had funded the raid. After the Civil War, Mary Ellen had her race legally changed from white to black. In 1877, after the death of her husband, Mary Ellen built a 30-room mansion, which she shared with her business partner, Tom Bell, and his family. Tom Bell died in 1892. His widow, Teresa, sued Mary Ellen for her fortune, claiming that her husband had created the fortune. Apparently, Tom Bell had registered all of the businesses in his name as sole proprietor and not as a business partner of Mary Ellen. The courts ruled against Mary Ellen and she lost most of her fortune. 
She lived destitute in her old age and died on January 4, 1904. She is buried in Tulake Cemetery in Napa, California. In 2015, the San Francisco African American Historical and Cultural Society erected a memorial in memory of Mary Ellen Pleasant. It is at the intersection of Octavia Street and Bush Street. The association honored her for her work with the Underground Railroad and for desegregating the San Francisco public transportation system. Mary Ellen Pleasant outsmarted the system more than one time. She did what she had to do to help her people. She passed for white when that was beneficial, but she returned to her roots when she carried out her mission. And even though she lost or was cheated out of her wealth, she leaves behind a rich legacy, a legacy of character, of courage, and of love. Mary Ellen Pleasant, you are a phenomenal woman as a descendant of slaves, I honor you and appreciate you beyond measure. Mary Ellen Pleasant, rest in peace, my sister. And these are the phenomenal five slave women that outsmarted the system. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please subscribe, leave a comment, give me a thumbs up, and share it with a friend.